We falsely think of our country as a democracy when it has evolved into a mediaocracy, where a media that is supposed to check political abuse is part of the political abuse. These commercial entities now vie with the government for authority over our lives. They are not a healthy counterweight to government. They are as big as or bigger than government, and they work closely with government. The most powerful special interest in Washington today is the media, because not only do they give money and lobby and do all the things that industries do in Washington and companies do, but they, of course, control whether or not a politician's mug gets on the tube. Now, that's power. That's the ultimate power in a, in a political realm, is, is controlling perceptions. In George Orwell's novel, 1984, Winston Smith worked at the Ministry of Truth. But his job was not to ensure that truth was preserved. Quite the contrary. His job was to alter past news stories so that the version of the truth given by the ruling elite, the party, was never contradicted. If the party, which Orwell called Big Brother, lied to the people, a quick check of Winston's altered records, the only remaining records, would prove that the lie was true. Can lies become truth? Could a media system, controlled by a few global corporations, with the ability to overwhelm all competing voices, be able to turn lies into truth? These corporations are not answerable to the people. Only the politicians can regulate them. Could corporations possibly buy politicians with campaign contributions? Contributions so large that the politicians would allow unregulated corporations to go about their business of eliminating less powerful voices until only one voice remained one truth. This documentary actually started 20 years ago when I was in graduate film school. It was around the time of the hostage crisis. It seemed to me at the time that the way the news was being covered was changing, and that this was typified by Rupert Murdoch's New York Post. So I went and I interviewed the editor of the New York Post on video, very primitive video. Do you think that uh, you people increase public panic sometimes about shortages? Yeah, yes, I, actually I think that's where, it's, uh, that, that's where the panic starts, uh, through uh, the media coverage, through newspaper coverage, television coverage. Do you think that the New York Post tells the true story? Well, sometimes you cannot uh, dip in the media. I think what they create is they create, like this, you can create a panic, right? New York is a tough town. can be very abrasive. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I'm not a great believer in adding to anyone's anxieties. Peter Mitchellmore was quite candid with me that day. Later I found out why. Hey, Lenny, yes, go on. Uh, I'm incompatible with the uh, newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> the, the paper's fine, it's selling well, but it's not my kind of newspaper anymore. That's it. That day in 1980, we spoke about the hostages and the new phenomenon of the never-ending story. They were finally released the day Reagan was inaugurated. I didn't think anything of this coincidence at the time. Twenty years later, a series of extraordinary events took place. For me, they provided a window see the selling of the Iraqi war, the media's handling of the 2000 election, and the Supreme Court's decision in a new light. The question became whether there was a pattern in the way stories are covered and then dropped. Had it become easier to purposely manipulate the news? Were they not covering certain stories on purpose? 
Meanwhile, over the years, I had descended into the third world of independent film. But as it happened, right next to the review of my movie was a review of The Insider, a film about the killing of a news story. I took this as a sign. But how to get at the truth? I read about a man named Charles Lewis, an X60 Minutes producer who had created a unique nonpartisan news organization. The Center for Public Integrity broke the Clinton-Lincoln bedroom scandal. He had also done a report on George W. Bush's SEC violations for inside trading. In the 60s, three in four Americans trusted their government. Today, it's one in four uh, Americans trust the government. The level of secrecy and the amount of money in our process is greater than it's ever been. Archibald Cox, a Watergate prosecutor I interviewed for our book, The Buying of the President 2000, said the level of trust in in this country is worse than he's ever seen it, including during Watergate. People sense, I think, that the financial elites and the political elites have become one and the same and that the people themselves have no voice in Washington or in their state capitals, that they are somehow being left behind. When we think about democracy in the United States, we oftentimes, and I think certainly in our media culture and our political culture, the assumption is that the type of democracy we have in the United States is the only type that could possibly exist. It's the high watermark of the human race is capable of, is U.S.-style democracy. In fact, though, I think we have both in theory and in many ways in practice um, a fairly what you call a weak democracy. I mean, in fact, in many ways we have a, a frighteningly weak democracy. There is an unfortunate sense as well of powerlessness, that there really isn't very much that can be done about the state of things. You can't have 280 million people and say that two political parties represent the, the thinking of 280 million people. Let's just, just think about that. If you are, just come on, step back and look at that. And you know, the thing is, is that anthropologists, they're going to dig us up hundreds of years from now, and they are not going to understand us. No, seriously. And we made a huge mistake inventing film and videotape because we're leaving behind a record of ourselves. We have a situation in which uh, a significant percentage of the population doesn't vote, doesn't care about the issues, uh, is tuned out entirely, is what we call depoliticized. Uh, in fact, we have a rate of depoliticization in the United States uh, that must make a tyrant, like in, you know, Indonesia envious. They say, how can I get one of these vegged out populations? The, the top 1% that controlled 90% of the wealth had two major political parties doing their bidding for them. And the other 99% had no political party on the ballot representing them. And no representation in Congress representing them. And yet that 99% ran around waving little flags going, we're free! We're free! We live in a democracy! Woohoo! Oh, we're gonna look like assholes! No, seriously, folks! We gotta leave a note behind and explain our actions! We have more instant access to information as consumers and as citizens than we've ever had in the history of the country. That does not necessarily mean we're better informed. <laughs> and that's the. That's a fascinating irony by itself. There's an apposite quote from Dr. Goebbels. It's a kind of an explosive, you know, thing to invoke here. But he said once, and this is an example of how sly he was, that what you want in a media system, and he meant the Nazi media system, is uh, ostensible diversity that conceals an actual uniformity. The truth of the matter is, that increasingly what we see, what we hear, and what we read is being controlled by fewer 